Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. It is a great privilege to have Professor Salim Abdul Karim giving this afternoon's lecture. Um, and I've just said to him that I was so taken aback at his readiness and willingness to, to give a lecture to the Winter School program, um, for which we are very, very grateful. Thank you very much and welcome everybody on the Saturday afternoon. Hello, everyone. My name is Mamu Khetipa Keng, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town. On behalf of the UCT Winter School, I welcome you to this very timely webinar titled COVID-19 in South Africa, delivered by the renowned Professor Salim Abdul Karim. UCT's annual winter and summer school programs are open to everyone. You don't need any kind of qualification to participate. This is our way of embracing the wider community beyond our campuses. And now that we are online, that community extends around the world, including alumni and friends across Africa and on other continents, NGOs and community organizations who can benefit from listening to experts provide the most recent insights into their respective fields of knowledge. Wherever you are, you are part of the UCT community. The Africa Center for Strategic Studies reported earlier this month that the surge in the Delta coronavirus variant is set to cause hundreds of thousands of deaths across the continent in the coming months, unless preventative measures are scaled up and access to the COVID-19 vaccine is improved. The Delta variant, which was confirmed in 22 African countries, has been found to spread 225% faster than the original virus. Less than two months after the Delta variant emerged in Uganda at the end of April, the number of cases across Africa had nearly tripled and more than 30,000 fatalities were reported. Today's webinar is designed to give you a well-informed update on COVID-19, both globally and with a special focus on South Africa. In addition to receiving a high-level analysis on the response to the current crisis by government, society and medical science, you will hear about some of the key lessons we can apply in the event of future pandemics. Only a handful of people in the world are as qualified to speak on this topic as Professor Karim. He's a clinical infectious diseases epidemiologist who is widely recognized for his research contributions in HIV prevention and treatment, and who has applied his vast experience to the challenges brought about by COVID-19. He's the director of the Center for the AIDS Program of Research in South Africa, CAPRISA, based in Durban, the CAPRISA Professor of Global Health at Columbia University in New York, an adjunct professor of immunology and infectious diseases at Harvard University, adjunct professor of medicine at Cornell University, Pro Vice Chancellor for Research at the University of KwaZulu Natal, and until recently co chair of the South African Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID 19. While he has resigned from this position to return to his important work in HIV research and innovation, he remains a member of the Africa Task Force for Coronavirus and a member of the Lancet Commission on COVID-19. I am proud to hand over to the virtual podium to Professor Karim. Right, thank you very much. It's indeed a great pleasure and an honor for me to be here with you all today. I know it's a Saturday, so you must be especially keen to hear about COVID-19 to be sacrificing your uh, Saturdays to your Saturday morning to or afternoon to participate in the session. Well, what I want to do in the next 40 to 50 minutes is I'm going to talk to you about the COVID-19 pandemic and I'm going to focus on South Africa and I'm going to touch on some of the good things that have happened during this pandemic, some of the bad things that have happened and some of the complicated issues we've had to deal with. And so you're going to be hearing about the good, the bad and the complicated. So let's get into our presentation. So the first thing I'll talk about is the state of the current situation of the South African COVID-19 epidemic before I go into the lessons learned. So let's 
recall a year and a half ago, how did it all start? Well, I happened to be actually taking a hike in the Drakensberg mountain on vacation with my family uh, on the 30th of December. And while on this hike, I get on my iWatch a ProMed alert. And that's how the world got to know about this new disease, this undiagnosed pneumonia that was being seen in a Chinese town called Wuhan. Now, as I was walking, I sort of ignored this. <laughs> I looked at my watch, I read the message. Uh, it can't be anything important, I said. You know, at worst, okay, it might be SARS. I said, the Chinese know how to deal with SARS. No point in, you know, dealing with it. So I just ignored it. But about 11 days later, on the 11th of January, I was in my office and my colleague, Professor Dolavera, runs up to my office. His lab and office is a floor below mine uh, at the medical school in Durban. And he comes up and he shows me his cell phone and he says, have you seen this? This is the sequence of the virus. I said, what? On your cell phone? He says, yeah, it's on Twitter. I said, Twitter is for, you know, high school students to talk to each other. Is this, you mean there's a whole viral sequence on Twitter? And he says, yeah, here it is. It's been put on the way in the, on Twitter. And so we looked at it and that's when we both realized that, you know, we're dealing here with something that is quite significant, something that is different. And it didn't take long. Essentially about 19 days later, the WHO declared uh, this epidemic that was now spreading in China as a public health emergency of international concern. Now, at that stage, uh, by the end of January, this disease was now already in 18 other countries. So you can imagine that it was already growing and particularly impacted was Italy at the time. And so reflecting on this, one of the things I did was I brought together my team early in February, we sat down and we said, what are we going to do about this? This is a pandemic that's coming. We, you know, we're not going to escape this pandemic. It's going to hit us. So how are we going to deal with it? And so we made, we made a decision that very day, we're going to separate the lab. We're going to put a partition down the middle of the lab, uh, just a paper partition, separate it, contain the one side with strict uh, procedures and we'll convert our old HIV lab with does PCR testing for HIV. We're going to convert it to look at uh, SARS-CoV-2. At that stage, it, it didn't even have the name SARS-CoV-2. It hadn't even been called COVID-19. It was at that stage called novel coronavirus. And so the picture you see here on the right hand side, that's my a PCR laboratory at Caprisa in Durban, and it was converted. And you can see how we increased the stringency level, uh, taking it up to you know, BSL-2 plus uh, standards, and we converted and we used the BSL-3 lab, so high level of biosafety to do COVID testing very early on. At that stage, I think there were only about three or four labs in the country that could do this testing. So as it all pl uh, plotted on, on the 5th of March, we saw our first case. And I didn't know the patient and I didn't know the doctor seeing the patient, but I subsequently established that uh, this is a very good doctor. She, she really was on her toes and took this up when she saw this patient, followed all the procedures. It was really done very well, I have to say. And uh, so this patient was diagnosed. He had just arrived back from Italy. He had been part of a group of about 10 people who'd been to visit Italy. He actually went on a skiing holiday. Um, and then on the 15th of March, our president declared a state of disaster. And in declaring the state of disaster, it means that schools had to close. Uh, 
the uh, borders were closed, and there were a whole lot of procedures that were put in place, including uh, the prevention of uh, gatherings and so on. And it was on the 23rd of March that the president then announced that we will go into a lockdown, which later was called the level five lockdown. At the time the president said that we'd have a lockdown, there was no levels. Levels was something we developed uh, in the ministerial advisory committee and that joins a little bit later. I myself got thrown into the thick of things on the 23rd of March, when the minister Mkhizi called a meeting of scientists to ask for advice. And he invited me to attend the meeting. And at the meeting, he said, okay, we need a committee of scientists to advise us. And he asked, well, didn't ask, he just appointed me to chair it. And in, in that, that's how the ministerial advisory committee came to be. But it was the very next day that, uh, no, it wasn't actually the next day, it was a few days later, but I was asked to go and investigate an outbreak of COVID at St. Augustine's Hospital. And boy, what an education that was. I went to St. Augustine's and I mean, within four hours, I had the most amazing picture of how this virus spreads. I was able to visualize how patient zero, who had just come back from the UK via Dubai on Emirates uh, two days earlier, how when he came for a test, how the doctor attended to him in a separate area because he came in as a COVID suspect. But that same doctor uh, was treating an elderly woman in the emergency room. And so through his hands and stethoscope or whatever it was, spread it to this elderly lady. She was admitted to the ICU. She passed it to the two patients across the, uh, her bed. And she was subsequently discharged, went back to the Burr Buchanan home. She infected four people at the Burr Buchanan home before they realized she's still infectious and brought her back. And when they brought her back and they admitted her, she infected four other people. So you can imagine how hospitals at that time weren't geared up. We didn't, we didn't know what was required. And I remember, as I you know, was instructing them, saying to them, okay, we've got to create three zones in the hospital. We're going to have a green zone, red zone, and yellow zone. And up to now, when I go to St. Augustine's Hospital, they still have the three zones. But at that stage, we didn't know. We didn't know what we were dealing with. We didn't know how to stop this. We didn't know what, what was going on. And when you think about from those days to now, how much more we know about this disease. And so when we look at the epidemic in South Africa, we went from a situation where we were originally, uh, you know, we had a rapidly growing epidemic. In fact, I'll show it to you here. So at, the, at this initial stage, South Africa had a rapidly growing epidemic, doubling every two days, the same rate at which the UK epidemic was growing. And so these two epidemics are growing hand in hand. But because of our very early actions, because the president instituted uh, uh, you know, the lockdown, the state of disaster, we flattened the curve. We slowed down the rate and the speed at which the epidemic was growing. And we moved from a doubling time of two days to a doubling time of 14 days. That was you know, huge because it basically bought us about two months before we had our wave compared to the UK. So we had more time to plan. And that's quite important to have that time to plan. But as we knew, when we eased restrictions, the epidemic was going to come back. You might recall in April, I said, you know, there's no, we don't have any mojo. South Africa doesn't have anything special that's going to protect us. This epidemic is going to hit us. And when it hits us, it's going to impact on us. We're going to see people getting hospitalized. We're going to need oxygen and so on. And through the form, that was our first wave. And as we uh, uh, came out of our first wave in about August of last year, we went into low transmission. And this was our sort of honeymoon period. We thought, okay, have we dealt with this now? Or is it coming back? 
when we looked at what was going on in other parts of the world, we said, no, it's coming back. It's coming back. We're going to get a second wave. But we didn't realize, when it, you know, and the minister had asked me, you know, when is the second wave likely to hit? I said, well, it's going to probably hit us in mid-December. And it didn't. It hit us about three weeks earlier. It started hitting us from around the last week of December, and uh, last week of November. And I'll come back to why. Because essentially, the second wave came early because the university students wanted to have their parties. And the high school students, who all finished their matric exams, wanted to have their parties. And they were not going to let some pandemic you know, stop them. And so we had this much, much earlier. But this epidemic was driven by a new variant. And this variant was much more severe. And so we had our second wave, we emerged from that quite quickly, went back into low transmission, only to now come into our third wave, which, and each wave has been getting progressively worse. And there's no reason to believe that the fourth wave is not going to be similarly, you know, even worse than the first three waves. So this is, this is the trend that we have seen. And this is not unique to South Africa. Every country that has had the third wave, uh, not every country, I speak a lie, it's about two out of three countries, the third wave has been more severe than the first and second waves. So it's been, it's been uh, pretty much a global trend that most countries have, have been having progressively worse waves. And so when we look at our third wave and where we are now, we had a seven day moving average that was close to 20,000 cases per day. It's giving us some idea of the enormity of this third wave. So we can translate that in that I always prefer to look at the test positivity rate. And so when you look at the left hand side, this number, when you see here 40,985, that's the average number of tests that we have done each day during that week and that's a week in june of this year so these numbers here reflect a daily average number of tests you can see in the, the second wave we peaked in that week with a, an average of 66 and a half thousand tests per day and that's 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 quite a lot in the third wave, we peaked at around 69,000 tests per day. And on the right-hand side, this is the test positivity rate. We ideally want to keep this below 10%. Right? To keep it in low transmission is normally below 5%. And you can see how we've been below 5% for quite a while. And that was you know, in the, the March, April uh, period, May period of this year, when we were in low transmission. And you can see how the positivity rate rises as we go into each wave. And that's a, a really good indicator of where things stand because it's not dependent on the number of tests that you're doing because the number of tests are also fluctuating. So this is a good marker. So it just confirms what you saw in the case numbers that it's also reflected in the positivity rate. So if you look at our three waves, and here I've superimposed them one on the other, you can see how they have differed, right? With the first wave uh, reaching a peak of 21 cases per 100,000 population, that's in the yellow line, compared to the second wave, which is in the blue line, compared to the third wave, which is in the red line. So you can see how our three waves compare to each other. And our third wave, we're not over yet because we haven't reached our peak yet. And let me show you what I mean by that. If you look at Gauteng, you can see that the first and second waves were similar in Gauteng. Took us a bit by surprise. We thought the second wave would be worse than the first wave in Gauteng, but it turned out to be pretty similar. But look at the third wave. I mean, the third wave is more than twice as bad 
as the first and second waves. I mean, you know, you can when you look at this, you can only imagine. Now, and I'm not living in Gauteng, but you can just imagine what it must have been like in Gauteng to have such a severe wave where you have more than twice the number of people infected coming to hospitals. It's enormous. And on top of all of that, you're in a situation where one of your most important hospitals, right, the, the Joburg Gen Hospital, that was now called the Charlotte McKay Hospital, you know, had a fire and so was out of commission. So one of your biggest hospitals is out of commission and you're dealing with this wave. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, and the, the magnitude of what they must have dealt with is only, you know, dead to imagine how tired those doctors are. And you can see it here. And this is the number of admissions, right? So if you look at the seven day moving average of admissions, that's the first wave. The second wave had more admissions. But look at the third wave. Massive, massive numbers of admissions and the deaths, much more deaths in the third wave. So there's no question Houteng has had a really bad third wave. It was spared somewhat in the second wave, but it certainly had a nasty third wave. And if you look at some of the other parts of our country, so this is where most of you are in the Western Cape. Now, this is quite dramatic and I'll, I'll touch on this a bit later. So that's your first wave. That's the light green line. Here's your second wave in the darker green line, right? peaking at around 48 cases per 100,000 population. Now compare that to where you are now, as right at this time, at about 40 uh, cases per 100,000 population. So you still uh, some distance away from your peak that you had in the second wave, but you're heading in that direction. Now we're not expecting that the Cape, Western Cape is going to have it as bad as Houteng, but we will expect that this number will grow. And so we will see uh, more cases occurring. So this is the situation in the Western Cape right now. Let's look at the situation in the Eastern Cape. So in the first wave, which is in the light blue line, they peaked at around 31 cases per 100,000. Compare that to the second wave, which peaked at around 27 cases per 100,000. And now they are at about 11 cases per 100,000, meandering along. Not sure why it's not rising faster, but we can expect that it will go a little bit further up before it turns and comes down. But we're not expecting it to go very high. It's not gonna, it doesn't look like it's gonna reach the levels that we saw in the first or second waves. And if one looks at KwaZulu-Natal, you can see what the first wave looked like. That's the light orange. And you look at the second wave. Wow, what a nasty second wave, right? Almost double the first wave. So very much like what Gauteng is seeing in the third wave, KwaZulu-Natal went through that already as did the Western Cape in the second wave. And you can see how the third wave has been interrupted by the looting and unrest and is now testing has started gaining momentum again. And so we are expecting cases to rise in KwaZulu-Natal, probably take about another week or so before it starts gaining momentum again. And also the testing gains momentum. And so we will see a slight increase in cases over the next week or two uh, driven by KwaZulu-Natal even though the cases are coming down quite rapidly in Gauteng. So that's the situation. Now, let's look at the global situation, because sometimes we forget that this epidemic is everywhere. This epidemic is all over the world. Everybody's grappling with this epidemic. Everybody's uh, trying to figure out a way to deal with it. And so when you look at the global pandemic, right, so this green line is the global pandemic, right? That's the situation globally. You can see how this increase here was driven by the US predominantly, and then to a lesser extent by Europe. So the US and Europe drove this peak, but you can see that this peak is driven by India. 
So India was the main uh, push behind this increase here. And if you look at the, we're now going uh, quite literally into the third wave here, that this is being driven by Europe, uh, by the US to some extent, but mainly by Asia, because we're now really seeing horrible epidemics in Indonesia, in Myanmar, in including even countries that we didn't see the epidemic before, like Vietnam, have been badly affected. So we're now in the midst of our third wave at a global level. So this is the world situation. So while you know we've been very focused on what we do and what's going on in our own backyard, the whole world's grappling with these waves and grappling with having to deal with the restrictions and so on. And if you look at closer to home in Africa, you can see how the three waves have borne themselves out in Africa. Our second wave, much worse than the first. The second wave was driven by the beta variant. And the third wave is much worse than the first or second waves, driven by the delta variant. And so if you look at the situation in terms of widespread epidemics, you can see most of Southern Africa and Northern Africa have been quite badly hit by the the current third wave of the pandemic. I don't know if you saw that this morning's news, uh, people in Algeria have been uh, protesting in the streets because of the lack of oxygen in Algeria. So the countries in North Africa are certainly going through a bad patch right now. Okay, so now we've got a sense of the global pandemic. We've got a sense of the epidemic in South Africa. We've got a sense of the way it has grown in each of the provinces. I hope through all of that, you've got some sense of where we stand. That within the next uh, week or two, we'll be hitting 200 million cases, reported cases of COVID-19, and just over 4 million deaths from this disease. I mean, it's just amazing to think about how a pandemic can spread like this. So let's go into, so what have we learned from this pandemic? What have we learned? What's been good, what's been bad, and what's been complicated? Well, let's start with good. What's been good? Well, what's, one of the things that's been good is how we were able to create testing uh, for this disease. I mean, just think about it. Uh, you know, I've been studying epidemics now for what, over 40 years. I, my first epidemic that I studied was in the 1980s. I studied an epidemic of measles in northern KwaZulu-Natal. And I remember when I wrote my report, the minister asked me to come to Cape Town to meet her. This was under apartheid. The minister's name was Rina Fenter. Most of you are probably too young to remember Minister Rina Fenter. And I went to brief her about why we have a measles epidemic in KwaZulu Natal. And subsequently, you know, I've studied so many epidemics. But if you just think back to HIV, you know, we saw the first cases in 1982. Right? And we only discovered that it was a virus in 1984, and it was only in 1985 that we had the first test for this disease. So for HIV, it took three years to get a test. And just think about that in what took two years in HIV, in COVID-19, it took one week, 11 days, we had the sequence. And by the end of uh, January, the test kits were widely available. So within a month, we had testing available for SARS-CoV-2. I've never had a situation like this before, actually. To have the, that kind of speed with which you know, we've developed uh, diagnostic capability. And of course, we've done this, some amazing studies, the recovery trial in the UK being you know, the cherry on the top, amazing studies that provided us with dexamethasone. And we now know that you know, using corticosteroids like this, that we can reduce mortality by about a third. That's quite significant. 
quite significant. So we've had some amazing successes in this pandemic in terms of diagnostics and in terms of treatments, but none more so than vaccines. I mean, for somebody like me who spent 30 years working on an HIV vaccine, and we still don't have an HIV vaccine, to see that, an HIV, uh, that a COVID-19 vaccine was developed in nine months is just stunning. In fact, I was asked on television in April or May of, of last year, how long would it take to get a vaccine? And I said, oh, it will take a few years. <laughs> I had no idea that we could do it in this kind of speed. And of course, we were able to do so, not because they could do it in nine months, but because we'd had 10 years of research on SARS-CoV-1. And so when SARS-CoV-2 comes along, Barney Graham, who'd worked on SARS-CoV-1, had the sequence all ready to go. And so he provided the sequence to Moderna and to Pfizer. And so the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines have Barney Graham's uh, original SARS-CoV-1 modified for SARS-CoV-2 in their vaccines. And of course, completely new technologies right, in mRNA and live viral vectors. So it's been quite something to see the progress that's been made and the achievements uh, in terms of vaccines. And especially given that we've given almost 4 billion doses of vaccines. I mean, from the time we've had a vaccine, which we, which we knew was efficacious, which was November last year, in basically eight months, we've given 4 billion doses. That's quite something. So you have to, you have to just marvel at, at what has been accomplished in the world of vaccines for COVID-19. So let's go on to uh, the next part of this, which is, you know, what else has been good? Well, the way in which vaccination coverage has been increasing in South Africa has been amazing. Now, we uh, uh, made some very important attempts initially. So a vaccine ministerial advisory committee, a dedicated committee was set up on the 1st of September. So the ministerial committee, the advisory committee that I chaired, uh, that had many of uh, you know our country's vaccine researchers, um, we didn't even think about vaccines. For us, vaccines were going to be you know sometime in the future, but we realized that we needed to do better about vaccines. We needed to do something, and in my discussions with the minister, he felt well, we should create a separate committee, and so we did. And this ministerial advisory committee then advised the government to join COVAX and to secure an advanced market commitment for 10%. Now, we chose not to set up an advanced market commitment directly with the drug companies that were making the vaccines, because it would mean we don't even know, right? Remember on the 17th of September, we don't know if the vaccines work. In fact, we don't even know if it's possible to make a vaccine. The world has never made a coronavirus vaccine before. So this was going to be the first ever coronavirus vaccine. Could it really be made? Uh, could it be successful? Anyway, it's a high risk situation. But if we wanted to, we could have taken an advanced market commitment. That means that we would engage with a company and say, we want to buy you know, 10 million doses of your vaccine. And we make that commitment to buy it and we pay our deposit. And the company uses that deposit to then build the manufacturing facilities and to start buying the raw materials and so on. So if the vaccine works, they will have product that they can send you. Because you can imagine that, you know, it's a risky business. And so advanced market commitments share the risk. And so we started uh, having discussions about local vaccine production at the end of September. And we didn't really make much headway at that time. Remember at that time, we're not even sure what technology we'd be using for the vaccines. And then on the 1st of October, we started meeting with the different companies. We met several companies, in fact, that week. I remember we met with the Gamaleya Institute, we met with uh, Oxford AstraZeneca, 
we met at several companies and just that one week we started engaging in negotiations and discussions with them but much to my concern the government didn't pay its deposit to COVAX so we missed the deadline and in fact the COVAX set us a new deadline we missed the second deadline too and eventually the government paid COVAX in December so we missed the first allocations in COVAX which meant that we lost out in that initial batches of vaccines that we could get from COVAX. Turned out actually COVAX couldn't get doses early anyway because the advanced market commitments were prioritized to the wealthy countries. So the US, the UK, you know, the countries that paid to develop these vaccines were the ones that were going to get the first doses. So on the 9th of November, we saw results saying that vaccines worked. Wow, what an occasion. And by the 8th of December, a month later, the first person was actually vaccinated with a COVID-19 vaccination outside of a clinical trial. So you think about that, that's quite amazing that you can go from knowing that there's a disease in the first place to having a vaccine within a year. But there was a lot of pressure being put on government in January. Why don't you have vaccines? Where's the vaccines? Right? Because they're watching the US is vaccinating at quite a fast rate. And so too in Russia, China, India, and um, the UK. And those five countries could vaccinate their populations very quickly because they make vaccines. Those are the countries that make their own vaccines. Right? Uh, India, because they had an agreement with AstraZeneca, with the Oxford University, that they would make the vaccines in parallel with AstraZeneca. So those are the five countries that led the way. And other countries then came on board. Most of them were coming on board with vaccines before they were approved. So those were largely Russian vaccines, Chinese vaccines, that were being used. And they were used, for example, in Tunisia, they were used in Morocco, in Egypt, in our country, in, in countries in Africa and across the world. There are about 30 countries or so that use these vaccines before they were even approved. And so they got a head start on, on South Africa. And so eventually the president relented and decided he will try and secure doses, or the government decided. So they secured doses of AstraZeneca. And no sooner did they arrive in South Africa, then we had to suspend the rollout of AstraZeneca because it didn't, it wasn't effective against the local variant, the beta variant at the time. So now we got a vaccine, one and a half million doses that don't work uh, effectively against our strain. And so we had to pivot. We pivoted away from AstraZeneca to a vaccine we know works against the beta variant, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But the problem is it's not licensed. And so how do you roll out a an unlicensed vaccine? Well, you do so under trial conditions. And so that's when the Sisonke study rolled out and we started vaccinating our healthcare workers. And it took quite a while to continue to seal agreements with Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer, partly because, well, Johnson & Johnson didn't take that long, but Pfizer took almost two months or no, under that to negotiate because the stringent requirements were just onerous uh, in these agreements. But anyway, sign the agreement. And then of course the vaccine phase 1B and 2 start and there you've got South African vaccination skyrocketing. We've now delivered just over 7 million doses. We have over 10% of our population now vaccinated. And we moved from 1 million doses to 2 million doses to 4 million doses to 6 million doses in rapid succession, one after the other. And of course, one of the big setbacks we had to deal with, which is why this increase was delayed, was that the J and J vaccines, uh, you know, couldn't be used? We had to suspend the use of the J and J vaccines because of the U.S. The factory where they were made in the U.S. was had a contamination problem, and so 
this is where we stand now with a rapid increase in the number of doses. And we expect that that will continue and this increase in, in vaccinations will continue over the next two, three months before it eases. One of the other aspects of the good part of this response was that, you know, because of our early actions, we were able to plan very carefully. We put out very early on in uh, March, April last year, we put out a whole eight-stage plan about how we're going to deal with this pandemic, just drawing on our experiences from other pandemics and other epidemics. And, you know, we started building field hospitals. You might recall that by the time it came to May of last year, the Cape Town ICC was a field hospital, 800 beds. Every bed had oxygen. I mean, that's quite something. Uh, I mean, if you had asked me, you know, in February this year, you know, can you take the Cape Town ICC and make it an 800 bed hospital and make sure every bed has oxygen? I say, yeah, okay, I can do that. Probably take about five years to do it. Well, they did it in six weeks. And that, that was quite amazing, impressive. Well, lots of other things were done. Things that were done behind the scenes that most of the public is just not aware of. For example, we knew back in uh, March, April, first week of April last year, we had worked out that we don't have enough oxygen, that when we hit the first wave, we would run out of oxygen. So we had to figure out how to deal with this. So an, an NGO called Right to Care, together with Deloitte and the Department of Health, decided to tackle this problem. How do you do that? Well. There are four big companies that make oxygen in our country. We have brought them together around the table. Now you can't do that. That's illegal. So we had to get special permission from the Competition Commission to allow us to get the four companies to collude with each other. And in that attempt to bring them together, we then worked out and explained to them how much of oxygen we're going to need. And in explaining that, we then learned that actually half of all the oxygen they make goes to commercial purposes. And so they agreed that they will redirect all commercial oxygen to medical oxygen. And we then worked out what st uh, stocks they would keep. And we had to make sure that there was a supply available to every hospital within a 30 minute drive. So we had to build several new storage tanks uh, for oxygen. I mean, it was quite a task. And all of that was done by the time we hit our first wave. So when we had our first wave, we never ran out of oxygen. Oxygen was available. And it's quite something when you think about the second wave and the third wave and how bad it was. And we never ran out of oxygen. Oxygen has been available. And one of the early things that was done is we were worried that we didn't have ventilators. And so the Department of Trade and Industry commissioned a group to work on ventilators. And one of the companies is a company that makes your fridges and your stoves and your microwaves, DeFi. So DeFi changed its infrastructure and its line. And instead of making microwaves, they started making ventilators. So when you go to most of our hospitals and you look at those uh, machines that are providing oxygen, for patients who are awake, not the ones that are uh, in the ICU, but the other ones, those machines that are providing oxygen made by DeFi right here in South Africa. All of that done because of very early planning and very early activities to make sure we would not run out of oxygen and the machines to provide it. We also chose to go very open route, lots of communications. Every day the minister releases list of the number of cases and deaths and tests and so on. The president has his family meetings. The ministerial advisory committee provides it as its advisories and so on. So let me touch on the bad in the time we have remaining and the complicated. So I think the bad thing we've seen is just the scale of this pandemic. And some of the bad things we've seen have been, you know, for example, when we initially went into lockdown, we mobilized 70,000 troops to enforce the lockdown. And then we saw some abuses of that, especially the Collins-Corsa killing. I mean, you can imagine how 
disappointed and disillusioned it is to hear that we mobilized 70,000 troops to enforce a lockdown in March last year. And in July this year, when we have riots and looting of uh, supermarkets, the government mobilizes two and a half thousand troops. Like that's going to do anything. And I think that's the that's why we've seen that there's really been no real security in this instance because they didn't really mobilize troops like they did back then in March last year because they didn't know how how we're going to deal with this pandemic then. But we've also seen how you know some of the coronavirus funds have been looted and how uh, corruption has set in. And that corruption is not unique to South Africa, by the way. Coronavirus uh, funding and monies that were used for COVID were misused in many countries, including in the UK, where it was estimated that about one in five COVID contracts uh, were tainted with corruption. So it's, it's everywhere. But we've also seen one of the bad things is these super spread events. I talked to you about how the students you know, they were going to have their parties. They, they were not going to worry about, you know, some pandemic. And in India, unfortunately, the politicians, they encouraged people to gather in large numbers, whether they were for political rallies or in this case, for a religious festival on the banks of the Ganges River. So we've had these super spreading events that have just made the epidemic so much worse because they enable the virus to spread so fast. And then in the midst of all of that, we've got these variants of concern. The virus started evolving and we've got these names now, which is much better than giving them all these funny uh, combination of uh, alphabet letters and numbers. So we have the alpha, beta, gamma and delta. They are four variants of concern that have been classified as such by the World Health Organization. And if we look at what we've been seeing, you can see how from November, when we saw the first of the vaccine trials, barely a month later, we see the announcement of the alpha variant, then we get the beta variant, then we get the gamma variant, and now we've got the delta variant, and most recently we've seen the delta plus variant starting to emerge. And if you look at the three countries I've chosen, India, Brazil, and South Africa, in each of their first waves, you can see that it wasn't too bad. They were able to cope in all three countries, but new variants hit each of those countries. The Delta variant hit India, and you saw the horrific images in India. The Gamma variant hit Brazil, and Brazil is going through a rough patch and how we had the beta variant, and then we had the delta variant here. So we've seen how these variants have caused the virus to spread. And you can see how that these new variants increase the speed, and they are spreading so much faster. And when you think that the beta variant spread 50% faster, delta is even far faster than beta. So we're dealing here with viruses that spread really fast. And what we know is that certainly with the beta variant, that if you got infected in the first wave, you had no protection in the second wave. And you see that here. If you had no past infection, the attack rate was 5.3%. If you had been infected in the first wave in South Africa, the attack rate in the second wave is 5.2%. So you didn't have any protection. So what, what had been argued, oh, we're going to get herd immunity, and so we'll just let people get infected, it'll protect them. Nothing doing. It didn't matter if you've been infected before, you get reinfected uh, with the new variants. The new variants, especially the beta variant, is quite nasty in that respect. And we saw with the beta variant, not only does it impact on past infection, if you look at the vaccine efficacy for the AstraZeneca vaccine, which was 70% effective in the UK, it was only 10% effective in South Africa, basically not effective. Fortunately, AstraZeneca is effective against the Delta variant, as we know. 
Similarly, the Novovax vaccine was 89% effective in the UK, but only 43% effective in South Africa. So basically, we can't use these vaccines. They're not sufficiently effective against the beta variant. And so we had to switch to vaccines that we could use. Vaccines that were tested in South Africa as well, the Johnson & Johnson, which are 72% effective in the US and 64% effective in South Africa. So that's within the range. So that means that the vaccine is not being compromised. And the Pfizer vaccine, which is 91 to 95% effective in the US, is 100% effective in South Africa. But that's a small study, so I wouldn't treat it uh, with too much of importance, just to say that it's a pretty good vaccine, even against the beta variant. But we're seeing, in addition, the problems of vaccine nationalism. And I'll just quote here from the Director General of the World Health Organization, that the world is on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure. As Even as they speak the language of equitable access, some countries and companies continue to prioritize bilateral deals, going around COVAX, driving up prices, jumping to the front of the queue. Basically, what we saw was countries like Canada. Canada bought 10 doses of vaccine for every one of its citizens. So they monopolized it, right? As with Australia, Britain, and so on. So what they did is they put advanced market commitments. They went and bought vaccines from every manufacturer because they don't know if they're going to work or not. So they just hedge their bets, buy it from everybody. And so now they're in a situation where they are getting vaccines because they put the advanced market commitments in and the rest of the world doesn't have vaccines. And that's really unacceptable because to me, you know, this is really the dangers of the Trump-like me first kind of approach. And that fundamentally there's a mistaken belief by some countries that they can vaccinate their populations and they'll be safe. That's simply not true. In this world, with the coronavirus, no one is safe until everyone is safe. There's no end game that sees one country vaccinating its population and controlling the virus, while the rest of the virus is dealing with the rampant spread of the virus. You know, the rest of the world is going to lead to a situation where you get variants being created. So for me, we just need to stand together. It's in everyone's interest. So. We've dealt with the bad. Let me end off with the complicated in the remaining few minutes I have. And that is that one of the complicated things is that we have to make difficult decisions bravely. And we saw how in a previous epidemic, we didn't do that. We didn't make difficult decisions and made them bravely. Fortunately, in this pandemic, we did. We saw it in the US. For COVID-19, they had a politician, a leader that just wouldn't make the right decisions until they had a change and their new leader is making the right decisions. So we've also seen the big problems of trying to act early. So Neil Ferguson, who was one of the early advisors to the UK, is an epidemiologist. Uh, and he showed how the UK's delay in, in instituting a lockdown meant that the UK would have halved the number of coronavirus deaths in April if they had introduced the lockdown just one week earlier. Just look at that. I mean, there's no time to wait here. This virus wait, doesn't wait. It keeps spreading. So you've got to act and you've got to act decisively. You've got to act early. But it comes at a price. And we've seen how in the Lancet Commission, the economic effects of this pandemic are unprecedented. It's even worse than the Great Depression. In fact, Africa went into a recession for the first time in 25 years last year. And we've also seen all of the challenges about who should be prioritized for vaccine. That we have an unacceptable situation right now. The US, Canada, the UK are vaccinating children. They're vaccinating adolescents, low risk individuals while healthcare workers haven't been completely uh, vaccinated in Africa. Just showing you the, the gross inequity in the prioritization. 
we've seen how you know the lockdowns have impacted HIV and TB care. You know, HIV testing went down, TB notifications went down. Fortunately, they were all reversed after the phase, the, the level four and level five lockdowns, but they had did have their impact initially. And we've seen how the conspiracy theories abound. Whether, and I've seen it in every one of the waves. In the first wave, I had to deal with this hydroxychloroquine. I had to deal with, you know, this Madagascan uh, cocktail. And people want their miracle cures. They want to know where's my miracle cure. And as you go into a wave, they will want that miracle cure. The second wave, I dealt with ivermectin. And the third wave, I dealt with ivermectin again. It just never stops. People want, and they don't care about the data. Even if the data is iffy or borderline at best. And one of the biggest uh, promoters of false information was actually in this analysis undertaken by Cornell University. They showed that the US president was one of the biggest promoters of conspiracy theories on this virus. We've also seen the challenges in getting scientific advice. It's really difficult because there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of people with just personal opinions masquerading as science. There's the dangers of these people. I, we, know, we know it all here. Yeah. You know, focus on me, I'll tell you what the answers are. And we've seen that. And we've seen how people, instead of advising, you know, posturing, posturing in the process, they're giving personal preference, not evidence. And you saw that, for example, in the Mosineke Commission, you know, scientists are going and saying, you know, this is what you should do. This is what I know is going to happen and so on. You can't do that. You have the, the commission, well, you can do that, but the commission needs to get the facts, not, not your posturing. And I think that it's been a real challenge to deal with that. And every country has this problem. It's not unique to South Africa, by the way. It's everywhere. And we've seen how the truth has been a casualty, it has been a casualty everywhere. And in this particular instance here you know, in South Africa, we've had, you know, academics claiming, you know, after the first wave in September, oh, we've got herd immunity now. We don't need to worry. You know, we've, we've got some sort of herd immunity. We, we're going to have, you know, if we get a second wave, it'll be a very mild second wave. We've reached the threshold for herd immunity. Some, and there's a whole group of them under PANDA, Oh, this is not a serious disease. It's it's just like flu. Why why are we even treating it differently? And then of course you've got those who just promote misinformation. And we've seen the real challenges in the vaccine rollout. That you've got countries that have really done very well with vaccines because of deals they have made to bypass the procedures or jump the queue or, or to use vaccine diplomacy to achieve their goals. But in, this end, in essence, the countries that have done best are the six countries that make their own vaccines. That's the US, the UK, India, uh, Germany, uh, China, and Russia. So let me end off with my last slide and leave you with five lessons that I hope will be helpful to you as you think about the COVID-19 response. The first was, that whatever else we did, we took the disease seriously, we acted timelessly, made the difficult decisions. We proactively planned, we implemented interventions, we made sure we had oxygen, we made sure we had all these things done. And that helped us because then it ensured that we weren't in a crisis when we went into each wave. We were truthful and proactive in communicating. Yeah, we let the whole public, everybody knows how many numbers of cases we have and so on. Never before, never, never seen that in any other epidemic. But the COVID-19 response has had its errors, its problems, its abuses, whether it's the military, whether it's the corruption, whether it's the miracle cures that people want. And we've seen how South Africans can move mountains when they act together. Yeah? They can see how you, know, you can convert the Cape Town ICC into an 800-bed hospital in six weeks. How DeFi can now be making ventilators. How we create a solidarity fund. But in all of this, we've got to really use this experience to prepare for the next pandemic. I have little doubt that we will be seeing new variants. We will be seeing new forms of this virus with its mutations. But also, 
that we will be seeing further epidemics and pandemics of coronaviruses in the future. So I hope that was helpful to you. Hope it's given you a sense of uh, how we just uh, try to exit that and give you a feel for what we've dealt with in this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor um, Karim, for that illuminating and very, very sobering talk. Um, there's a question from the two people. One is um, Mary Grace, and then after Mary Anwar Mull. Thank you very much for that very, very interesting and informative um, presentation. Um, I'm going to be traveling soon, so I've been looking into um, uh, COVID tests, and there's really an overwhelming number of um, different providers. Of course, there's different tests, but looking beyond that, different providers. And I was wondering if there's anything we have to be careful for. If anybody is, is it true that anybody that's advertising a COVID test is reliable or is there something that we should be looking to in terms of credentialing or other ways of vetting the test providers? So if you're planning on doing international travel, you need an accredited provider. The accreditation is provided by SANAS, S-A-N-A-S. If you go to any laboratory that is SANAS accredited, then you will have no problems. For the big SANAS accredited laboratories like Lancet Laboratories or Ampath or Global or any one of those, they are all SANAS accredited. And when you get the result at the bottom, it gives you uh, a number you can call to verify this result. So you can't cheat and you know fake the, the test result. It also has an online uh, web address that you can go to and again verify that the test is genuine. So those generally would be the best test to take is those that give you that option of verification. Okay, thank, th thanks. That's that's very helpful. Slim, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. You know, I have the impression, and I'm, I don't have numbers, but at a community level, that there are an increasing number of anti-vaxxers in our society. And a lot of them are relying on medical people to prescribe ivermectin. Well, what are we going to do about this? Because, uh, you know, I've heard people who promote ivermectin but say you must vaccinate. But there is a significant number of people who say, I will not vaccinate, I will take ivermectin in its place. Yeah. What are we going to do about that? Uh, this, this ivermectin has been a real challenge because mm. there's a group of uh, clinicians in the US that presented their results in Senate. They were given a hearing by the Republicans in Senate. And so they had that platform to promote ivermectin. A group called FLCC, I don't know them, but the person I've seen in the videos is somebody called Pierre Corey, who's not even a scientist, he's a clinician. But they have promoted ivermectin in a way that's you know, dubious to say the least, but mostly unethically. And we've had clinicians in South Africa and probably one of the most high profile is, is, a, is a GP who actually runs a slimming clinic. And uh, her name is Nasiba Katrara, runs yeah. a, a practice called Dr. Katz, which is for yeah. slimming. And she's been a very strong promoter of ivermectin. And it's really unfortunate because clinicians and doctors should not be promoting unproven medication. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, drug treatments for COVID are not like slimming treatments. You know, slimming treatments, <laughs> you can use whatever you want yeah. and get away with it. But you can't do that in treating patients for COVID. So it's been a real problem for us to get our own profession, you know, onto the right stream and focusing on doing the right things, unfortunately. 
Um, here's a question from Bruce. Professor, do you feel the beta variant is decreasing, the stroke disappearing, or will it become a dominant strain again? Ah, very good question, Bruce. So I can tell you that the beta variant has close to disappeared right now. I'm just shocked. We went from no beta variant to beta variant accounting for over 90% of our circulating viruses over a period of around three months, two and a half to three months. We never had that. I mean, beta didn't exist in August last year. And by December, it was dominant. And it is quite something because beta variant has a lot of mutations that are key to immune escape. But when we look at Delta variant, Delta wiped out beta, replacing it in a matter of about two months. In fact, less, six to eight weeks, Delta goes so much faster that beta has just no chance of keeping up. So we have almost wiped out beta in South Africa. It accounts for now under 3% of all our circulating variants. And Delta variant is now well over 90, 95% of all circulating variants. But the question you asked me next, which is more important, what's going to be the next variant? And in my view, the next variant is more likely to be something like the beta variant than the delta variant. It might have some of the characteristics of delta variant, but it's more likely to be like beta because the next variant is going to be an immune escape variant. So delta variant doesn't have the ability to escape immunity in the same way as beta variant. And so I'm expecting beta variant or a variation on the beta variant to emerge at some point. Of course, you know, it's all conjecture. We have to see what happens, but that's what I'm anticipating might happen. A question from me. Do you see more and more waves waiting for us in the future? Is that the way we're going to be living for the next while? I think, unfortunately, uh, the waves are not going away. Even when you have highly vaccinated populations, the waves will not go away because the vaccines are not able, especially when you take a virus like the Delta variant, the immunity is not able to prevent uh, infections to a sufficient degree. It prevents severe disease, it prevents hospitalization, it prevents death. So it has a high level of individual benefit, but it doesn't help in suppressing the viral spread adequately. It does prevent some infection, but not enough. And because it doesn't prevent enough of the infections, we are still seeing Delta-driven waves in highly vaccinated populations in the UK, in the US, in Israel. So it's hard to imagine that we will not have a fourth wave. I would imagine in all likelihood, we will see a fourth wave. Hopefully it won't lead to a lot of deaths because we'll largely be vaccinated by then. Uh, but I'm expecting we will still see uh, quite a lot of infections. And, and do you see a fifth wave following that? Unfortunately, yes, <laughs> I do. I do, I do. Until we get what I think is something that's likely to emerge towards the latter part of next year, which is a new technology. And right now, it's being developed by three or four big research groups. And the leading player in it is the Walter Reed uh, Army Research Unit. And it's called a pan-coronavirus vaccine. So they use conserved parts of many of the different coronaviruses and all the different variants. And they make a vaccine of the conserved pieces. And if the virus tries to change those, the virus gets hobbled. 
So it can't change those. It's got to keep those. And so that's what this next generation of vaccines are likely to be. And ultimately, I'm anticipating in a, you know, several years from now, we will come up with completely new technologies that are not even vaccine-based that will protect us. But it's too early, too complicated to explain all of that right now. Sure. But it uses CRISPR technology. There is a question from Maddie Gray, but it seems to me that we are going to be living with this for a long while still. Absolutely. Unfortunately, but yes. Okay, well, that's very, very grim. Um, but let's hear from Maddie. Hi, and thank you very, very much for this fascinating lecture, which puts the non-believers and the non-vaxxers into to shame. Um, my question is that I've seen recently in Sweden, in the northern Sweden, in northern Sweden, but also in other places now, that there appears to be a possibility that people like myself who've got been vaccinated twice, I've had Moderna both times, can actually be spreaders of the disease um, without ourselves being symptomatic. Mm -hmm. uh, this seems to me to be terribly threatening to the rest of the world. Can you, I'd be hap happy to hear what you say about it. Yeah, unfortunately, Mary, this Delta variant has the ability to evade the immune system, right? And the way it does so is through a process called cell-to-cell -cell spread. So what it does, it goes from the inside of one cell into the inside of the, of the other cell without ever exposing itself to antibodies. So as a result, the Delta variant leads to a much higher amount of virus in the mouth and the throat. And so it's much more infectious as a result. It achieves the infectious dose much more easily. And unfortunately, it seems to be able to do so even in vaccinated people. Hmm. So that's why the vaccines are not proving to be sufficiently effective in holding back third waves. Now, what is important is that even though uh, infections are still spreading, very few people are dying. And that's quite important. That hospitalizations have gone down. Uh, deaths have gone down, particularly in the UK. It's striking, actually, in the UK as to how much deaths have gone down in the third wave. So, in effect, vaccines do two things. They give you an individual benefit, and then they have a population benefit. From the vaccines as they stand now, we are getting the individual benefit. Like we're not getting very sick, we're not dying if we're vaccinated. We're not getting the population benefit. We're not the vaccines are not stopping the virus from spreading enough. It is stopping virus from spreading to some extent, but not enough. And because it's not enough, the viruses are still spreading. And there are enough unvaccinated people in the community to help perpetuate this problem. So that's where we stand right now. Once we get to a situation where we can vaccinate children as well, and right now we can't, we can't vaccinate children below 12. No vaccine is safe, shown to be safe and effective in children below 12. But once we get to that, then we're gonna try to aim for the population benefit. But I think it's going to be a difficult hill to climb. Professor, I'm a historian and I've always been fascinated by the outbreak of the flu epidemic, the 1918 flu epidemic. Yes. Um, what I want to know is, um, is it possible that, because the way you've, your last comments has shown that we will be living with this virus for quite a long time, and you always you also said that there might be another wave, there probably will be another wave. So, 
is it possible that, that there will be a kind of accommodation with this virus in the way that we have accommodated to the flu virus, where it will be infectious but not harmful? Like, what I'm trying to understand is, are you are you say are you pointing to a future where COVID-19 will be with us as the flu virus with us, but not dangerous or fatal? Obviously, unless you develop very serious complications like pneumonia, then the flu virus is very dangerous. But all of us get flu and most of us recover. Is it possible that it will get to get to that point? Because when the flu virus, flu influenza epidemic broke out, people didn't call it, they didn't know it was influenza. I mean, they didn't call it then. It was also a new virus. Were people aware of, it, of that virus before the pan, flu pandemic? If you can just maybe... Thank you. Yeah, sure. I think there's, there's three things that feed directly into the answer to your question. The first is this virus infects many animals, it infects tigers, minks, cats, dogs. So it's in many animals. So we're never getting rid of this virus. Because if we ever even wipe it out of humans, it'll still be in, in animals. So it'll always come back. So we're never going to get rid of it in that sense. The question then comes about, can we really suppress it to a point where it's not as big a threat as it is now? And the answer to that is yes. Now, I'm not sure if vaccines will be able to do it on its own, not as we stand right now. And the reason I'm not confident about that is that the virus keeps mutating. Mm. So it's one thing to have vaccines, but it's another thing to have a mutating virus. So I think it boils down to the third issue. Right? So, so the first is it's in animals. The second is you know, you're dealing with a mutating virus. The third, the third thing is that it's going to depend on the race, the race between human and human technology and the virus and its mutations. Okay? Who's going to win this race? Can we develop technologies that will outwit the virus ahead of time? In other words, can we predict what it's going to do next and protect the population beforehand? That's going to be the challenge. And so one of the things we're doing right now in my lab is we've taken the beta variant and we've taken the delta variant and we are forcing them to mutate. We're putting them under pressure with antibodies to see how they mutate. Sure. Because that's going to tell us what the next variant is going to look like. So that's how we're going to have to try and get one step ahead of this virus by doing experiments and predicting where we're going to go, making vaccines beforehand so that we, we are preparing the population. Because if we don't do that, if we, if we don't do that, we're going to be doing for the next two to three years what we've been doing in the last 18 months, which is we're playing catch up. The virus is dictating terms, and we are just trying to keep up. That's all we're doing. We're just trying to keep up. Right? We need to get ahead of the game. We need to get one step ahead of this virus. That means we've got to have our technologies and our just our sheer brilliance in order to get, give us that head start over this virus. So that's why I think we can do so if we can win the race between humans and the virus? Well, all I can say, Zulaikha, I don't know if you have another question, but I can. all I can say is thank you that the world has people like you. Um, that's. I think you've just said something very, very important, and, and it's the first, it's the first light I've, I've had in 18 months to hear what you've just said now. And perhaps we can we can finish with a comment from Maddie Gray, who is a South African who lives in Sweden half of the year. Um, you are making me so proud 
of South African competence, and Anne says, here, here. Uh, glimmer of hope, thank you, from Kale, Gail Kagan. Thank you for your time on a Saturday. Appreciate it very much. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Yeah.